Hi! In this video we're going to be talking about some tricks to help you measure angles more accurately. So there's a lot of tools that we can use that help us to judge the angles on rectangular forms more accurately. This is really helpful if you're trying to draw a perspective from life rather than just from theory and out of your head. And um, it's, it's ways that help us um, make note of those angle changes a little bit more accurately. So some of the tools that I have with me today are, um, well, one thing that you can make yourself, this is a little viewfinder that I've made, and this one's designed to fit paper that's 9x12 or 18 by 24 I've drawn a 3 by 4 inch grid right on a piece of really thin, kind of cruddy plexiglass that I found in an old uh, picture frame, like a poster frame. You can also take a piece of glass out of a frame that you buy at Goodwill for a couple of dollars and tape off the edges so that you're not going to cut yourself. This is just a little bit of artist tape that I wrapped around the edges of this and I drew on it with a Sharpie pen or a paint, a real fine tip paint marker. And this mimics the way your camera or, you know, a viewfinder would inscribe horizontal and vertical lines over the scene so that you can compare whether the lines that you're seeing are truly horizontal and vertical or if there's some sort of in-between angle. So this can be a really helpful tool. I also can use it for compositional studies if I'm trying to choose a part of the still life to draw. I've made this ratio the same proportions as my drawing paper so then if I grid off a similar number of squares on my drawing pad then it really helps me make sure that I'm placing the objects in the right place relative to my viewfinder. So this can be really helpful. Some other things that are really great is having a skewer or some sort of real thin pencil that you can use to take some measurements off the object. This little device is a something that seamstresses use and tailors in order to make sure the hems on the clothing are consistent with, but it's something that you might be able to find at a place like uh, Joanne Fabrics or some sort of fabric store, quilting store. And the nice thing about it, it, it has this little triangular piece here and then another movable little arrow here. And so you can use it to take measurements of the object uh, out in front of you. So you can take a measurement on the height and then count off how many of those fit into the width. It's a really convenient tool. But anytime you're using a tool to take measurements, I need to remind you how important it is to make sure that you're always keeping that measuring tool a consistent distance from your eye each time you take a measurement. Otherwise, this, these things don't do you any good. So lock that elbow like the picture shows down below. Try to also make sure that you're never, as you're taking measurements, try to maintain that 90 degree angle between the angle of your eyes and the tool, whatever measuring tool you're using. Even if the plane that you're trying to measure is moving away from us like this side of the box is, resist the urge to poke the measuring tool into space at the same angle that the box is. Always make sure that you're imagining a plane of glass, which is our picture plane, that helps us translate those three-dimensional objects into a flat surface so that we can then transfer it to our paper, which is also a two-dimensional surface. Another device that I'll be showing you in a minute here is using a protractor. So this is really helpful if you're trying to judge the angles of an object. We'll show how you can position it at a corner of um, that you're trying to measure and then judge what kind of angle we've got as planes are moving away from us. But again, this is another one where you can't poke, you can't angle it into space. You have to keep it perpendicular to your line of sight, so a 90 degree angle. And then uh, Another thing that people will use is just a standard ruler. So if you brace your elbow so that that's always the same distance, again, don't let it extend into space. Imagine that it's up against glass. And you can just look at how many centimeters or millimeters one portion of the box is compared to another portion so that you can really keep those measurements accurate. A final tool that I'll talk about is this little homemade device. I just took two pieces of map board or like the backings of a sketchbook and connected them with one of these little brass fasteners. And the nice thing about this is, again, you can hold it up as if it's up against glass, so make sure that you're not poking it into space and moving it that way because that defeats the purpose. You have to keep it as if it's at a right angle to your line of sight. But then you can you can line up two different angles and um, you know, you'll align one with 
one part of the box that you're trying to measure and then you'll move this other one until it matches that angle perfectly and then pinch it so that it can't shift around at all and then you can even transfer that down to your paper and it should be a, a pretty close match to that angle. So we'll show a few slides here to kind of talk you through some of the, the uses here. One of the first approaches to drawing a box form is figuring out what the total height to total width is. So that's another way that you can just use your skewer, you know, mark the total height, turn it the other way, decide whether it's wider or it's taller and by how much. So if you can get that basic rectangular shape correct first, uh, quite a bit of the work has already been done. And then once you've got that basic rectangle that the whole box needs to fit in, then you can start to subdivide. So you might look at, well, how much of that that square or that rectangle is taken up by the top plane of the box, that diamond shape. And so one way to do that is you can sight and measure, move your skewer up and down, mark off the distance from the backmost corner of the top to the front corner of the top. Keep your thumb there and then count off how many of those will fit into the rest of the space here. So here's sort of a, a diagram of how that might work. You see that the whole box is about three and a half times that, that top diamond shape. So you'll be taking lots of measurements like this. The other thing you might notice is hold up your skewers if it's a dividing line along the front corner of the box, maybe this corner of the box, and you'll compare how much of the distance uh, is to the left of that to get to this back corner, and then how far over we need to go to get to this corner. So in the photograph, we see that the front corner of that white box is just a little bit to the left of the center line. So if you had your rectangle drawn in, you could kind of estimate where the center is and move that line just a little bit to the left of that. And we'll be pretty close to where that front corner needs to be. So we talked a little bit again, just I'm going to keep reminding you about keeping the tool perpendicular to your line of sight. That is the most critical thing to do when you're taking literal measurements off of an object that you're seeing from real life. Some other people will take a, um, you can buy, you can get these free downloaded PDFs of the clock face. You could photograph or photocopy that onto a transparency, like an overhead transparency that you can get at the bookstore for, you know, 30 cents or something. And you can hold that up in front of you too, or you can tape it inside one of your little frames and hold that up and compare some of the angles to the face of the clock. So what you would do is you would place that center of the circle on one of the key points that you're trying to measure, let's say this point or this point, and then you would notice where the other two angles lie relative to where they would fall on the face of an analog clock like this. Our eyes are notoriously bad at judging angles. I mean, we're pretty good at, at deciding if something's truly straight up and down, and we're moderately good at deciding if something really is a horizontal. But when it comes to those in-between angles, we are really, really bad at estimating what those are. So we need all the help we can get to judge those angles more accurately. Here, we, we're still using a clock face, and we've just shifted it to check some different angles. So you could imagine those red hands of the clock moving to several different points to judge several different angles within the same drawing. And one thing I want to point out is the closer the box gets to our eye level, the, the more acute, the, the skinnier those angles are going to become, especially on the top plane of the boxes. So one of the most common problems is when you're judging this distance from here to the back edge of the box, the tendency is to want to really tip that plane up as if we're seeing a lot more of that top surface than we really do. So what you need to do is kind of carefully measure, you know, let's I'm trying to do this so I can see it in the camera, but I would measure that distance and maybe count off how many of those fit down the length of that front edge of the box so that I don't overestimate what that distance is. That's, again, the most common problem is because your brain knows that this box is closer to a square, you start to override what your eyes are telling you and you start to force it, the drawing, to look like what your brain thinks it should look like. So try to um, trust your measurements more than what your brain th tells you that box should look like and hopefully you'll do pretty well there. So using this L tool, 
one of the challenges is um, this works great when you're when you're judging uh, pretty wide angles. So what I would do, I'm trying to do this so the camera gets it lined up in the right angle. Um, let's see, yeah. can't quite get it to line up where I need it to. So let's say you're judging this angle here. Once you've got it locked on there, you can move it over to your drawing and um, you know trace it onto your drawing. But it works best if you can make sure that one edge of your L tool is always aligned with one of your true verticals. So notice from this angle of the camera, this is not truly a horizontal edge and neither is this, neither is this edge or this edge. So the only true verticals or horizontals that we have to go by would be these three planes. And so if one of your edges of the L tool aligns with something that's truly vertical, then as you're making adjustments with this other one, it'll be easier in your drawing to make sure that that angle is really correct. Uh, because you might you might be getting you know this angle right, but unless you get the orientation of it right as well, the drawing's still not gonna make sense. So if you can, um, like in this next, so I'm just in the slide here, you can see that big obtuse angle where we've got two different angles added together. Um, even if you had the angle right, if it's slightly angled the wrong way on your paper, it's not going to look right. But if you just think about one half of that angle at a time and line up one of them with the vertical and then move the other one, then uh, it's easier to find a true vertical in your drawing and, and then that second angle is going to be more accurate. Again, here, you know, checking one of the obtuse angles. You can you can flip that tool however you need it to check all of those angles. Where you get into problems sometimes is an example like this for our box. See how tiny this angle right here is? And sometimes if you go to try to match that angle with your V tool, by the time you get down to that two or three degree angle, there's hardly any space visible on your L tool. So to remedy that, to fix that, instead of just trying to, to make that measurement of that super tiny angle, you can combine two angles. So I'm, I'm looking at the acute angle, but I'm also looking at the vertical plane next to it. And so that then it's a lot easier to use this tool because you're taking much bigger uh, measurements here. And, and then we have a longer straight edge to use as a reference. And then a third or a kind of lost count of how many different <laughs> devices we have here. But another thing you can use is the transparent protractor. And again, you want to make sure you're not angling it into space. You want to keep it as if it's up against a glass window and you can use it to judge some angle. So what I would do is try to align this point where the, the um, little T is right with one of your corners. That one would be a good one to choose or this one. And then um, try to hold it nice and straight as you judge what angle any of those obtuse or acute angles are. All right, so one more reminder, don't let that angle away from you in space or all of your measurements are going to be wrong. You have to always try to double check that you're holding that tool at a right angle to your face as you're measuring. So for the homework assignment, we're going to be drawing some boxes in perspective in, from real life. So we're, we're using a combination of things. We're going to be using all of our measuring tools, all of the things I just talked about are options, using the viewfinder, using your protractor, using creating some sort of little L tool to help us judge the angles, uh, definitely using your skewer. You can have your ruler. Um, but as far as choosing an angle to draw from, I want you to find a cardboard box. Almost everybody should have a cardboard box. If not, they are free at the recycling places. Find one that's um, you know fairly good size and pretty good condition, not too beat up. And you're going to be positioning it in real life, so you're not going to work from photographs. You're going to lay a real box out in front of you, and you're going to start measuring it out. So the easiest point of view is this kind of view where you have one point perspective. It means that the front bottom edge of the box is a true horizontal. All the flaps that are moving away from us on the face of the box are also going to be true horizontal lines, and it's going to take a little bit less measuring 
the angles that we need to deal with would be on the side flaps mostly and the flaps that are coming towards us at the two end lines need to converge a little bit but basically this is about as simple as you can get as far as how to position the box if you feeling if you're feeling like this is an overwhelming kind of project um, set your box up so that you're seeing it like this. I do want to see at least some of the inside of the box, so don't set yourself so low that all we see is the rectangle of one side of the box. Do show me at least uh, a little bit of the side plane or the top plane so that it has some depth to it. If you're up for a little bit more of a challenge, this is maybe the second easiest way to view it. So we've turned it so that we're seeing it from a corner, which means we're thinking of two-point perspective, but it's still essentially flat. All the flaps are just even with the ground plane so they are just going to be an extension of the angles of the box once you get those figured out you're just extending those same lines out to help figure out all the angles of the flaps and another tip i've listed in our three bulleted points here is you're not only taking measurements but you're also looking at the negative shape so i want you to think about that the shape of the tabletop that the box is sitting on in this photo and if you can match those kind of angles and slices of pie of um, the white tabletop or the light gray. If you can get those correct, then the flap should be pretty accurate too. So you're using several skills. You're taking literal measurements. You're looking at the negative shapes. This is especially helpful when you're drawing the flaps. And if a flap's really foreshortened and coming at you, those are super hard for your brain to make sense of. So looking at it just strictly as a flat shape can help you uh, decipher that information. And the third thing I want you to do is keep the perspective theory that we've learned in the back of your mind. So you are not going to be able to locate the points on your paper in real life. You know, your points are going to be five or six feet outside of your range of view. But in your mind, you should be thinking, OK, I know all the lines that are running east and west on this box need to eventually be getting closer together, which means the front corner of the box should be a bigger measurement than the back corner of the box. These should be gradually converging. And there's slighter convergence this way. It's closer to one point perspective. But if we follow these two along, they also should be getting a little closer to each other, which means that this measurement on this edge of the box should be a little bit smaller in your drawing than the one that runs along this edge. So you're looking for things to be getting smaller as they get farther away from you. And so even though you won't be plotting this out with really precise perspective like we did when we were drawing things from our imagination. I do want you to remember what you've learned in those exercises and um, you can use some of those to help you keep your drawing more accurate. The other thing you might notice is on some of these where there are two flaps that have been taped together on uh, a surface of the box, you know, what we know about the X works in real life drawing too. So if you draw an X from, you know, this corner of the box, to that corner of the box, and then from this corner of the box to this corner of the box, you can find the exact center in perspective. And that way, if you want to show the tape mark where the two pieces come together, you could draw that really quite accurately. So we'll, oh, let me show you a couple more slides. Um, if you're up for even more of a challenge, let's, let's play with some of the angles of the flap. So here the box has been flipped over and each flap is at a different angle. So it takes a little bit more measuring, a little bit more attention to uh, the, the subtle angle changes. The other thing I'd like you to do is as you're constructing these boxes, think of them transparently. So in this photograph of the box with the flap, even though the two sides of the actual box, so let's say this were our, our box, these two sides are covered by flaps, but we have enough information to be able to locate those hidden corners because we know where, you know, this corner of the box in the photograph is. So we could extend that line straight down to find that hidden part of the box. And we see this corner of the box in the photograph. So when you connect those two, we could locate that hidden corner that's back behind that slanting flap. And we could do the same thing on, um, you know, the back corner of the cardboard box that's over here too, because we, we can locate this corner because we can see it through the open mouth of the box. And we know again where this corner is so we can just extend those lines back and find that point, even though it's hidden from our view because of that flap that's coming towards us. So if you construct everything transparently, it things should work out pretty well. And then something like this might be an even more 
uh, more of a challenge. The flaps are concealing more of the interior of the box, but we still have quite a bit of information that we can track back where those hidden plane changes need to be because we're seeing enough information that we can sleuth together the missing parts. So I'll be using this box example when I do the demo for the next video, so be sure to watch that too. All right, good luck with this one. It should take two to three hours if you're if you're really doing the measurements accurately, so make sure you allow enough time to get this drawing done well.